uh, the hearings in the matter of CFI 45 2022 before Justice Michael Black. The claimant is represented by Sol International and the lead counsel is Sarah Malik. The defendant is represented by Clyde Co and the lead counsel is Edward Kemp of Matrix Chambers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kemp, it's, uh, Kemp, it's your application. Um, but before we start, can I just um, clarify something uh, in, in my own mind, if I, if, if I may? So you, you've, you've taken the approach that I should grasp the nettle um, and decide the issues um, you put before me. Um, but let me ask you this. Uh, hypothetically, as it would be at this stage, if, if I took the view as a matter of pure contractual construction without any um, uh, without any recourse to any surrounding circumstances or evidence uh, that, uh, for example, um, the, um, th that I, I would follow Corinth uh, and so uh, Commerce Bank AG and Commerce Bank uh, AG Dubai branch or DIFC branch uh, and indeed London branch and Singapore branch are all really manifestations of the same entity. If I were also to find as a matter of construction um, giving effect to the words continuity of employment in uh, the, um, the, the letter that was sent uh, to the claimant uh, when he commenced work in the DIFC that uh, on uh, a fair construction that meant that he only ever had one employment contract uh, and that uh, it went through a number of uh, amendments or, or uh, and restatements in terms of when he moved for example from from London to Singapore and then Singapore to um, the DIFC and, th and then thirdly that paragraph 20 of the uh, letter that's sent to him it is an opt-in to the exclusive jurisdiction of this court for any dispute uh, relating to that amended uh, and consolidated contract. If I were to find all of those things, and I'm not saying I will, but if I were, um, would you accept that at any forthcoming trial that those findings would be binding? Um, yes. Um, but that would not dispose of this application. Um, the reason why is that um, obviously there's a statutory concept of an employer um, under the employment law. And also uh, the other point is that the term employee um, can only apply when the circumstances in Article 4 bite. And the claimant wasn't, uh, those circumstances didn't bite on him until after the 11th of uh, January 2021. So he cannot bring um, the historic uh, discrimination claims, i.e. those acts or, or omissions prior to the 11th of January 2021, uh, which is when um, Article 4 applied to him um, and he became an employee within the meaning of the DIFC employment law. And so that is um, an aspect of the application that um, uh, is one where you can grasp the nettle uh, and, and, and deal with if um, you're essentially against me on um, uh, on that, on the contractual position. Okay, well, that's just so I understand the context of things. But, uh, I'm not going to stop you making any submission um, that you want to make um, to me. Uh, uh, and so, uh, well, thank you for that clarification. I mean, please do proceed with your submission. Um, Your Honour, you've probably gathered from our scope and argument, our submission is simply that the claimant was employed uh, by the defendant in the DIFC from the 11th of January 2021 until the 31st of December 2021, pursuant to an employment contract that was subject to the DIFC employment law. And as such, we say there are two consequences that flow from that. Any alleged acts prior to the 11th of January 2021 are outside the scope of the employment law because the employment law did not apply prior to that date. And the claimant had, we say, less than 12 months continuous service with the defendant uh, and has no entitlement to gratuity and associated penalties. Um, what I intend to do by way of structure is to go through the relevant provisions of the employment law that we say are essential to this application and then go through the relevant contractual matrix before making some summary submissions um, in, in respect to the points in dispute on this application. 
Okay. And, and you can also assume that I've done some reading. Of course. But, um, Your Honour, if I can take you through uh, the relevant provisions of the employment law. Yes, um, of course. Um, section B of case lines. Um, I don't know whether you're you're working from that. I, I um, am, thank you. And let me just um, drop down the menu. Okay, so if you give me the the um, the page number, I should be able to get to the particular provision. So B four is the um, page number which which has Article four, the the main provision in this application. Okay. Right, I heard. Thank you. And um, uh, four one, um, this law applies to, and then you've got lim a, any person having a place of business in the DIFC who employs one or more individuals, and it's common grounds between the parties that the defendant is such a person. And, and in my submission, the, the claimant was right to make that concession because the defendant had a place of business in Gate Village Five, and it employed, employed one or more individuals. And we then get Lim B, and there are three, um, I suppose, three or four parts to that. Um, the, the first part is any individual employed by way of an employment contract by a person referred to in Article 41A. And we say this was engaged from the 11th of January 2021 when the claimant commenced employment by way of an employment contract um by the defendant um we we then get an either or gateway uh to employee status um either a uh, limb uh, i is based within or ordinarily works in from the difc um pausing there that that gateway was engaged from the 11th of january 2021 when the claimant commenced employment in the DIFC and um, two agreed in an employment contract to be subject to this law i.e the DIFC employment law and the the parties and I'll, I'll take you to the provision in a moment had agreed uh, in the employment contract to be subject to the employment law from the date his employment in the DIFC commenced which was the 11th of January 2021 Um, for the sake of completeness, 4.1c, um, uh, 4.2 don't apply in the circumstance of this case. Um, they deal with uh, those on secondment um, working in or from the DIFC and, and local and federal government employees in the DIFC, so we don't need to worry about them. But what we can say is this, that prior to the 11th of January 2021, Neither of the gateways in 41B, I and, and 2 um, were engaged or capable of being engaged because the claimant was not employed by way of an employment contract with the defendant prior to that date. He was working in Singapore on an employment contract with the Singapore branch subject to the laws of Singapore. And prior to that point, he was working in Singapore and prior to that in London on an employment contract with the London branch subject to the law of England and Wales. Ms. Malik um, refers to what, what, what she describes as imposing a temporal limit on Article 4. That's not the point at all. The point is, does Article 4 apply and when does it apply to the parties? And that's important because the employment law provides a complete code of rights, duties and obligations between uh, the employee and the employer. And it's important to know when the employment law applies, such as when uh, that those rights, duties and obligations are engaged. And it isn't a question this. Um, on the proper understanding of the DIFC contract, is it um, 
to be interpreted uh, as a retrospective application of DIFC law to the totality of his employment? Um, no, it's not. Um, uh, the, the, we, we submit there's nothing in the contract to support that. And there's no warrant um, in the statute to support that. Um, well, that's, a, that's an answer. That, forgive me. That's not an answer to the question I put. Um, that's the next stage. The first stage is whether I've identified the question correctly and you're giving me your answer to that question. Think about it. So yeah. is the question that I'm being asked to consider, does the, does the contract retrospectively apply DIFC law to his, to the, his employment before uh, he joined um, the, the um, DIFC branch? And then the answer is what you're saying, or, or am I barking up the wrong tree and do I have the wrong question? I think the right question is whether the terms employer and employee apply to the parties at the time of the um, the, the acts or omissions complained of. That's the point. Here we're dealing with the application of statutory rights in the employment law and, and, and it's irrelevant what um, uh, is contained in, in the contract uh, in my submission. What so matters, the contract, you say the contract's irrelevant, you say? Well, it's only relevant in so far as um, it contains an agreement um, that the employment would, would be subject to DIFC employment law. And we'll look at the um, precise ambit of that, that, that clause in a moment. Um, the choice of law and, and governing jurisdiction clause is not on point because that simply says it's the laws of the DIFC or the jurisdiction of the DIFC. What's on point in terms of 41B2 is wording in the contract that states that the employment contract would be subject to the DIFC employment law. And there is a provision on that, um, but it doesn't go so far as to say that there's a retrospective application of the DIFC employment law. But the point I was making is not that the employment law itself says retrospective, but the parties have voluntarily submitted by contract to the employment law acting retrospectively. We, we, we don't, um, uh, uh, well, I, I know you we, don't accept that. I just want to know whether you that think that that's a relevant question or you say, or, or you're telling me that the contract, what they've agreed is irrelevant. Uh, I, I think I think all the, the only relevance of what they have agreed is that the um, employment contract would be subject to the employment law. Because the, the relevance of that is, is um, that then um, the gateway at 41B2 can, can, can apply. So your answer is that even if on the proper construction of the contract, the parties have voluntarily submitted to the jurisdiction of the DIFC courts over the totality of the claimant's employment history, that's trumped by the wording of the employment law. Is that what you're saying? So there are two separate questions. You've obviously got one as to the jurisdiction of the DIFC courts to deal with the dispute. And then you have the separate and distinct question of the applicability of the employment law to the parties in the dispute. And it's that question that's at the heart of this application. When does the employment law apply? Yes, I mean, you may, so you may well say it's impossible to apply retrospectively when there existed two prior iterations of the agreement applying different systems of law. Exactly. 
So even if this court did have jurisdiction of the totality of the employment relationship, anything prior to uh, January uh, of 2021 would have to be determined under the law that applied at that time, whether English or Singaporean. No, I don't think that's correct because the um, uh, DI, the, there would be jurisdiction to hear the disputes, but uh, DIFC employment law would not apply prior to. That's what um, I'm saying. And so there would be no. Um, the parties have by contract said that all claims without qualification on one view have to be brought before the DIFC courts. That's what clause 20 of, of, of the letter between the parties or contracts and the parties said. So does that mean? Uh, that any dispute relating to his employment under an English law or Singaporean law contract would have to be brought before the DIFC court? Um, well, um, that isn't the claim that's been advanced by, by, the, by the claimant, but I can see that that, that could be um, a, a scenario applying the cascade provisions, the waterfall provisions. Um, because what you, if you just turn into those, um, <clears throat> that's assuming that one reads, uh, one reads clause 20 in a very wide way, it is also possible to read it in a way that's limited only to disputes arising out of the particular contract. Yes. OK, what do you want to show me? Well, I was just looking at the waterfall provision in um, 45, Article 8. Um, OK. Where's that in the authorities? So this was this is in um, uh, B um, of case lines in the in the um, the claimants authorities. And is there a page number I can um, navigate to? Yes. Um, let me just find that. I think it's that's it's, okay. It's, Take your time. It's no problem. It's B forty five. I think it's B forty. B forty five. No, it's not. Um, it's there an in the respondents index. Page number forty two. It's uh, three one eight of B, if that assists. Thank you very much. Grateful. OK, yes, I have it. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, so you, you, you there have the, 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 the so-called waterfall provisions um, and um, 82A. Um, so as so far as there's any regulatory contract, the DIFC or any other law enforcing DIFC, so the employment law, but if that doesn't apply prior to the 11th of January 2021, the law of any jurisdiction other than that of the DIC express, expressly chosen by the DIFC law, that wouldn't apply. The laws of a jurisdiction as agreed between all the relevant persons concerned in the matter, which is then when you may look at the laws of Singapore, or you may look at the law of England and Wales. Yes. But we're looking very far back in time in, in terms of, of that. Um, and, um, and and there it is. Um, the, I mean, the, the limitation period in England and Wales to bring a claim is three months from the last act complained of. Well, that, uh, that's a di I mean, those, those are different issues. They may well, they may well mean um, that if the court uh, is to uh, apply those uh, those different laws, uh, there is then to be an argument whether 
the relevant limitation period under those laws applies? That's a rather difficult question when when you're dealing with conflicts, isn't it? Yeah, well, yes, but there would be no um, uh, the, the because the employment law does not apply. The limitation period therein cannot apply. Um, but, but there it is. Um, but, but can I um, carry on? And I will address you on the um, scope. You take you, you take your take your own course, please do. Um, but just um, going. So we were on Article Four, and I've, I've given you our submissions on Article Four. Yeah. Uh, so they're not capable of being engaged prior to the 11th of January 2021. Um, I want to move on to the interpretation provisions, and these are also important um, for our arguments. Yeah. B34 is. Um, Sorry, the, I you just broke up slightly. B. B34. Thank you. Thank you. And um, 11B, uh, the definition of a person, includes any natural person, body corporate or body unincorporate, etc. A non-exhaustive definition, and it's common ground that the defendant satisfies that definition. Yes. Um, the defendant's a recognised company and would meet that definition because it's drafted in non-exhaustive terms. The defendant doesn't have to be a legal entity in order to be a person within the meaning of that definition. But the definition is a, ca a definition is a catch-all definition. I mean, it, it doesn't define the juridical nature of the party. It, it is a list of um, attributes to a party that would qualify it as a person under the legislation. Yes, but the uh, obviously. Um, there needs to be a person in order for 41A in particular yeah. to clients. Yes, and, and a, a company with a branch uh, is a person within the meaning of the, the legislation. Well, we, we would we would say that a branch is a person within the meaning of um of, of, of that legislation. Um, that's our position. Yes. We 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 bolster that. Um, position by looking at the defined terms and uh, uh, 35 um, paragraph 3 of schedule 1 and start before you get to the table. It says in, in this law, unless the context indicates otherwise, the defined terms listed below shall have the corresponding meanings. Mm -hmm. And um, employee uh, is on page 36, B36. An individual referred to in Article 41B or C. So they must be an individual to whom the gateways that I've described apply. Um, an individual can't be an employee within that meaning if they're based within or working for a foreign location, have agreed in an employment contract to be subject to foreign law, and are not on a secondment in the DIFC. And we then get the definition of employer, which is an establishment or entity. So there's no requirement for there to be a legal entity. So in our submission, it's irrelevant that the branch is not a legal entity in and of itself. It is, it can, it is an establishment or entity, and therefore um, it, it's an employer within, within, the, within the terms of the employment law. It's a statutory concept of employer that's relevant here. And the other point that's, that's important, um, in particular when it comes to continuity of service, is that the law contemplates only a single employer. The, 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 lang the language of the singular is used both in the term employer and in the definition establishment or entity. It does not include the concept of an associated employer or a related employer or a main employer. It is simply Sorry, where, 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 are we, where are we looking at in the definitions? Looking at the definition of employer. OK, oh, so the sorry, because you went to continuity and you said it's important for the definition of continuity. It doesn't contemplate. Um, it doesn't cont contemplate. Um, but that's not that's a submission. That's not that's not something I find in, in the law. It's a submission I'm making from the yes. definition. So. 
we see the definition is what it is, but two important points to take from that. It's in the singular. So there is the concept of a single employer that applies. And um, uh, and um, there's no concept within the definition of an associated employer or a related employer. Uh, that's to meet the argument of the um, claimant, isn't it, to import the English definition? Yes, that's something that simply can't be done. I think. I no, think I, that's I, well, uh, I, I'm going to take some persuading that you can import English substantive law into DIFC law. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, but 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 um, so that's the the definitions in the schedule. But then you take a step back and you look at the law as a whole, and unsurprisingly, the employment law is replete with references to employer and employee. Uh, and the terms we submit have the same meaning throughout the law. There's nothing that, that indicates any other meaning should be applied to those terms. And just to pluck one example out, it, it is part nine, the discrimination provisions, um, B23. Yeah, an employer must not discriminate against an employee. Um, that provision simply can't bite if at the time of the acts complained of, either the employer is not a person having a place of business in the DIFC who employs one or more individuals, for example, the Singapore branch or the London branch of the bank, Yeah. Or, and in any event, if the individual is based or ordinarily working in or from Singapore or London and has agreed to be subject to foreign law, the law simply cannot apply to acts or omissions before the parties became employer and employee and the employment law applied to them. And, and we submit to hold otherwise would be to give employer and employee a meaning that they simply do not have pursuant to Article 4. And that requires redrafting, we submit, which, as is well known, DIFC common law is not something this court can do. It's for the ruler to legislate. And it's important to know, I've already made this submission, that just while we're on the law as a whole, um, the law provides a code of rights, duties and imposes obligations throughout the currency of the employment contract and not just at the point of enforcement. And so in order for the rights, duties and obligations to bite, you need to be an employer and an employee at the time. Um, there's no warrant for any retrospective application of the employment laws. It, it distorts and twists the meaning of employer and employee in the law. So, Your Honour, that's our position on the statutory framework. And we say it doesn't apply prior to the 11th of January 2021, and therefore it would be correct to strike out those paragraphs that um, rely on the law prior to that point. Alternatively, an immediate judgment on those, par on those paragraphs. And, and just one point my learned friend makes about continuous conduct, to be clear, that presupposes that the law applies to acts prior to the 11th of January 2021 in the first place. That is the issue in this application. We're not running this application on the basis that there's not 
in principle continuous conduct. That's a matter for trial in the event that we lose and the law applies prior to the 11th of January 2021. What, what, do you say, what do you say about the express provision regarding continuity? Um, I'm going to come on to that. OK, OK, in your own time. You've seen in the skeleton argument that we had um, put in a, a House of Lords decision by analogy, Globe Elastic Thread, that the parties cannot agree um, to um, uh, extend or expand statutory rights. Um, the rights either apply or they don't. It's a matter of uh, statute. And the fact that the contract may preserve continuity for one purpose, and there's a dispute between the parties as to what that purpose is, but assume um, the purpose is to preserve service for um, uh, internal policies such as a redundancy policy, for example. Um, we, um, we uh, the, the, the defendant cannot be stopped from denying continuity in the very different context of statutory rights. And I'm going to take you to that authority in a moment because okay. we're not seeking to import uh, statutory concepts into DIFC at all. We're relying on that authority simply by analogy that there's a similar statutory right in the UK that relies on continuity and there's a case um, where the parties have agreed um, a longer period and um, the House of Lords deals with that very situation um, that, I've, that I've described and we say is on point here okay. um, and consistent to the courts. Um, that, that, I think, deals with the statutory framework, and I've given you our submissions on that. Um, so I want to go now to the relevant contractual matrix and um, start off with the contract. So if we now move to section A of case rights. And it's page 38, A38. Thank you. And um, we have a um, the contract on DIC branch letterhead. Um, we're pleased to offer you employment with Commerce Bank DIC branch, subject to the terms and conditions stated therein. The terms and conditions of your employment are as set out below and in section B of the bank's employee handbook. A copy of the employee handbook is enclosed with this letter. So the contract itself identifies the defendant as the employer. Um, it's point number one. I'm, I'm going to come on to um, clause four, which contains the continuity clause in a moment. OK. But just on the issue of identity of the employer, um, there's another document I need to take you to, which is the employee handbook. Um, and if you go to A88, Um, that's the um, handbook um, uh, for Dubai employees. And on A89, um, the first paragraph says, this handbook is intended to provide you with information about Commerce Bank AG, the bank, and serve as a reference to its practices, policies, procedures, and benefits for Dubai-based employees in the Dubai International Financial Centre only. And then the fifth paragraph there says section B, terms and conditions of employment of the handbook forms part of your contract of employment. So there's incorporation of um, section B of the handbook into the contract of employment with the defendants. And if I just take you to um, section B, um, which is on, if you go to page 93, A93, Yep. Section B, terms and conditions of employment. One, employer, you are employed by Commerce Bank AG Dubai branch. Um, we say the defendant as the employer is an express term of the contract that's being 
incorporated into the contract of employment between the claimant and the defendants. And we submit this, that the express term has primacy. It's unnecessary to imply a diametrically opposite term that there's a different employer. Nor is it legally possible to do so without overriding the express term of the bargain that the defendant is the employer. Sorry, I mean, you keep on saying the defendant is the employer, but let us assume and test it in this way. Let's assume the claimant succeeds in, in part in its claim. Against whom does it enforce its judgment? Well, they, they've sued the, the branch, um, so they would they they would have to enforce the the decision against the branch. Well, you say they sued the branch. They sued That's Commerce the Branch, a uh, Commerce Bank AG DIFC branch. Yes. But that rather begs the question, doesn't it? What as the juridical nature of Commerce Bank AG DIFC branch? I mean, let's assume that they got a judgment against a Commerce Bank a AG DIFC branch. I mean, a there is no juridical person against whom one could enforce called Commerce Bank AG DIFC branch. It's Commerce Bank AG, isn't it? Yeah, we accept that. Um, we, we accept that uh, the branch is not a legal entity in and of itself. Um, it doesn't have to be for the purposes of uh, the... I understand, I understand your argument that for the definition of employer under the employment law, it needn't be a separate juridical person. I understand that. But as a matter of contract, the yes. express terms of the contract do state that the branch is the employer and Miss Malik's arguments um, seek to either imply it in a diametrically opposite term or somehow uh, argue that um, this doesn't reflect the reality but under 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 a contract, let's leave the definitions under the uh, under the employment law. But uh, under a contract, can essentially a non-existent party be the employer? Um, I, I think as a matter of pure contract law, that is that is a difficult argument to sustain. Um, <laughs> to be frank. Yeah, um, that's not the issue here. Um, but but when one looks at well, your client... submission, your submission at the moment is taking me to the contract, not to the statutory definition. So I'm just trying to isolate the two. Yes, but when you're applying Article Four to um, the the facts, um, what you have is um, an employment contract with the defendant, the branch which according to its express terms, identifies the branch as the employer. And so Article 4 is engaged with the defendant um, being the employer. The, the difficulty with Ms Malik's argument uh, that it should be Commerce Bank AG is it's not Commerce Bank AG that is contracting um, uh, with the claimant. And well, that's what I'm just trying. That's what I'm just trying to... Uh, I, I, I'm just trying to isolate. Um, you say it's not Commerce Bank AG that's contracting, um, but Commerce Bank AG Dubai branch is Commerce Bank AG. Yes, but um, the the express term of the contract is that the branch is the employer, and the argument that Commerce Bank. Um, uh, is the employer we submit um, overrides the express terms of the of the contract between the parties. Okay, and is inconsistent with that. 
And there's, it's unnecessary to employ a different term, nor is it possible to do so. Further, and in any event, both parties, the claimant and the defendant, have acted in accordance with that express term. And we see that because it's the defendant, the branch, that terminated the employment contract. We get the termination letter at A46. Um, A46 is the termination letter um, written on behalf of the DIFC branch defined as the bank. And it is regret that, with regret that on behalf of the bank, we inform you that the bank is terminating your employment by reason of redundancy. And, Miss, Your Honour, are you there on page A46? Yes, I'm there. I'm there. And Ms. Malik um, concedes in her skeleton argument that the defendant um, terminated uh, the, the claimant. And she says, therefore, that the defendant should be the employer for the purposes of Article 66 the, um, for the, the, on the um, gratuity payment point. And now we say that um, uh, she can't have it both ways. It, it, it's the same definition of employer that's applied throughout uh, the law uh, 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 from the beginning through to the end. And that is that is and always has been uh, the defendant and not Commerce Bank AG. Um, both when one looks at the contractual matrix that I've outlined, but then also when one applies Article 4. So I, want to move I want to move back to um, the employment contract and deal with clause four and then the um, jurisdiction clause. So if we go back to A39. We get underneath clause four, uh, we've got the provision as to commencement um, and it's common ground between the parties. The employment did commence on the 11th of January 2021. And then we get this employment will continue indefinitely unless terminated in accordance with the terms of this letter or DIFC law number two of 2019 as amended for DIFC employment law. That's the, the reference to um, the, it being agreed that DIC employment law applies. Um, that's the, the scope of the reference. Um, there's no provision that, that says that the law applies retrospectively or anything like that. Um, and we get your previous employment with Commerce Bank AG which commenced on the 1st of November 2006, should be recognised as continuous service. That clause doesn't purport to extend statutory rights in the employment law, but nor can it do so because it's merely a, a provision in the contract. Um, so what does that mean? Well, it means that um, for the purposes of application of internal policies, for example, a redundancy policy, where you get a payment which is calculated based on your length of service, your continuity of service is preserved for that purpose. But what it can't do is um, uh, purport to extend statutory, statutory rights in employment law. The application of statutory employment rights in the law it is one for uh, statute rather than contractual agreement between the parties. And the extent of agreement as to the DIFC employment law is in the clause above um, that I've just taken you to. So, sorry. 
So if the claimant had redundancy rights arising out under English law, arising out of his English period of employment, this is intended to preserve that. Um, not, not. Um, uh, this is intended to preserve rights for the purposes of an internal redundancy scheme, a contraction redundancy scheme, if you will, okay. um, which, which there is within within um, uh, the Dubai uh, branch, a redundancy um, uh, policy. Um, which is an issue um, in the underlying claim. I won't say too much about it. This is a matter for trial, but in principle there is, and, and the payment is based on the on 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 um, on your length of service. And so there, that there's a rock. So it deems paid. it deems his length of service for the purpose of of DIFC uh, contractual uh, redundancy provisions uh, as beginning in 2006. Right, and there was a similar clause in the Singapore um, contract for precisely the same purpose in Singapore. OK, so if I if I had to, uh, and I've not applied my mind to it because I've not looked at it at all, but uh, again, hypothetically, if I if I had to ultimately decide upon his um, entitlement under the contractual, not statutory, but under the contractual uh, redundancy provisions as applicable in DIFC law, not under any previous law, then I take 2006 as, as the start date. Is that right? So there isn't any um, statutory redundancy right in the DIFC employment. No, that's, right. that's what I'm saying. I, I, that's what I'm saying. Sorry, uh, maybe we're talking slightly at cross purposes, but for the purposes of the application of the um, DIC branch's internal. Yes, that's what I mean. Yes. Not for the purposes of statutory rights, which is. That's, what I'm, I'm, that's exactly what I'm saying. Is, is if uh, at some point I had to look at the, the, his contractual entitlement to redundancy payments as applicable within the DIFC, then the then this provision tells me that I take the start date as November 2006. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. OK. That's as far as it goes. Um, we respectfully submit. OK, I understand the point. Um, and um, And then A43 um, is the uh, governing law clause. And um, you see there the first sentence, your contract of employment shall be governed by the laws of the DIFC. That, that, that um, sentence isn't sufficient um, to engage Article 4.1, um, uh, I think it's it's uh, 4.1b2, because that provision on its face uh, is that the uh, there's been agreement as to this law, i.e. the DIFC employment law, not just uh, the laws of the DIFC. Um, so that's that's point sorry, I'm not sure I understand that submission. You just write by me again. Um, the, the that that um, let me just um, uh, get the um, the the terms of, of, of Article Four up as well while we're looking at that that clause. Um, the terms of Article Four One uh, B Two. Yeah. Uh, are that agreed in an, in an employment contract to be subject to this law, which can only mean the DIFC employment law. Yes. This clause, um, it, it says uh, your contract employment should be governed by the laws of the DIFC. So that clause can't in and of itself engage the gateway at 41B2, 
Why not? Because it's it's saying um, it, it doesn't explicitly say um, uh, governed by the laws, employment law. Well, I mean, but, we're not that, saying... but the employment law is one of the laws of the DIFC. Um, well, we're not look, we're not taking any any point that the employment law does apply from the 11th of January 2021, and and there is um, a um, provision that I've taken to in clause four that that does um, uh, show agreement that the employ DIFC employment law applies, but just looking at um, uh, that that clause um, on its face, without the other reference in clause four wouldn't be enough to engage the gateway for 1B2 because what's yeah, that's, what I, that's what I don't understand. If the employment law is one of the laws of the DIFC, why it, it wouldn't be included in it? Well, it's, an, it's I think this is a moot point, um, but because we do have a reference to the DIFC employment yes. law or in any events. But I mean, so uh, yes, but you make the submission, presumably it's going to lead somewhere. So I just need to understand what you're saying. I'm just, or it's I'm not just, going to lead somewhere. I think it is a moot point. Um, so okay. I'm not going to touch that point further. When you look at the second sentence. Um, you submit to the jurisdiction of the courts in, of the DIFC in the event of dispute and agree that any action against the bank um, may only be brought in the DIFC. So it's common ground, there is jurisdiction in the DIC for the disputes, um, but that can only be taken so far. It, it, it doesn't, um, uh, there, there isn't a contractual basis to apply um, the employment law um, prior to the 11th of January 20, 2021. So there's nothing in the contract to support that argument. And, and so we we submit that again, having regard to the contractual matrix, the um, allegations prior to the 11th of January 2021 should be struck out or immediate judgment should be entered in respect of those. Um, what if, so 20 um, is, is difficult. Um, you submit to the jurisdiction of the DIFC courts in the event of dispute, doesn't, doesn't define what sort of dispute, and agree that any action against the bank, so the bank is defined as the totality of the bank, not simply the branch, may only be brought in the DIFC. So let us assume, for example, that in December of 2020, uh, he was injured by the negligence of an employee of the bank. Um, doesn't matter where for, 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 for present purposes. Does this clause mean that he has to bring those proceedings in the DIFC? December 2020? Yes, yeah, so before he starts his employment, let's put aside the arguments about statutory construction and let's assume that uh, he, he was the victim of a tortious act uh, before January of 2021. Does this clause mean that he is now, that once he commenced, once he'd signed this agreement or agreed to it, he was bound, he had submitted unconditionally to the jurisdiction of the DIFC courts to bring any claim in relation to any dispute against the bank as defined, which is the bank and all its subsidiaries in the DIFC courts. I think that's a difficult argument to sustain because um, prior to the 11th of um, January 2021, uh, the claimant was employed um, on a different contract um, that was subject to uh, the laws of, and jurisdiction of Singapore. Yes, but that may well be then that, that we're only talking about the jurisdiction of the court. Um, and of course, the court can um, determine a, a, uh, a case according to the laws of any jurisdiction. 
But I, th I think it goes further than that because I think um, that the um, that contract contains a, um, a a Singapore jurisdiction clause. I need to. Um, is well, let's assume a, let's assume it did. But uh, and let's assume as a matter of pure contractual construction, one regarded this as, uh, as I said before, an amendment and restatement, arguably of a, of a continuing contractual relationship, then that will be superseded by by this clause, which is later in time on ordinary contractual principles. Um, if that is so, then is it arguable? that this clause is subject to your arguments, which I I recognise are on the construction of the employment law, but subject to that, is it arguable that this is an unconditional um, submission to the jurisdiction of the DIFC courts for all and any disputes against the bank and its subsidiaries? I, 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 I think that um, this clause takes effect from the 11th of January 2021, when he commenced employment. From that point, yes, we, 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 would, we would take that point. Prior to that, however, the fact is that uh, the claimant was employed on a contract that had a Singapore uh, non-exclusive jurisdiction clause, and we can see that at A229, at clause 14 of his previous contract, that was still in force prior to the commencement of this contract. So as at December 2020, he would have had to have brought a claim in uh, the courts of Singapore in respect of any such negligence. But you accept, you accept that after the 11th of January, that Singaporean contract was no longer in force. So if he had a claim that he that was still within the limitation period, but related to his period of employment in Singapore, what happens then? Well, we would we would we would argue that he would still need to bring that under the um, in the courts of Singapore because that it relates to a dispute uh, in respect of that contract. And um, what we 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 submit is meant by in the event of dispute when one looks at the, the you can't just take those words in isolation. You have to look at the contract as a whole. What it must mean is a dispute in respect of or arising out of this contract. But you actually say the bank is not his employer. Don't you? I mean, uh, you, say, you say there is a, you, you make a, a, a dichotomy between the DIFC branch and the bank. So this is this is about claims. This is about claims against the bank. Yes. Um, well, the, sorry, the dichotomy we make is only for the purposes of the application of the employment law, a statutory okay. choice. So to be clear, you accept the dichotomy doesn't apply outside the employment law? Correct. Well, um, save that, um, uh, as I've already submitted, it's an express term that the branch is the employer. But that depends upon the definition of employer under the employment law. Yes, well, yes, that, I mean, this is the, the very um, heart of our application, the definition of employer under the statutory employment law. Yes, because that 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 you say uh, uh, that you say deems uh, 
an otherwise uh, unincorporated entity as the employer. Right. Yes. Yeah, that's our position. Yes, I understand that. So um, I think that um, probably we can we can move on now to some just summary submissions on some of the points of dispute. Um, sure. Just to make sure that you have our position. Um, and um, you were going to take me, you said, to a Supreme Court decision, um, which I have to say interests me um, about uh, the ability of parties to, um, uh, if you like, so uh, it was the global global actic. Yeah. Can I can maybe be convenient to look at that now? Um, yeah, yes, I'm, please, because I, 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 I can tell you that the, the point that's at the heart of my thinking at, at the moment um, is the um, consistency or lack of consistency between the contractual and statutory uh, positions. OK, yeah. um, and exactly the point that you've put your finger on, um, that contractually uh, the bank um, and its subsidiaries uh, may be uh, a party for the purposes of uh, analysing um, contractual relations, but the employment law deems uh, a, a division or a branch of that bank as a separate employer uh, and that's what I'm that's what I'm going to have to grapple with uh, and yes. so help on that would be would, would be great thank you I think this authority is helpful so okay. if you turn to um, B268 uh, Okay, I have it. And the, the facts can be taken there from, from the head notes. Um, you, um, in essence, had um, an employee working for one company for many years, 1948 to 1970, and then uh, moved, uh, was transferred uh, across to another entity. Um, and you can see over the page at 269 at the top in the head note um, that the employee agreed to the transfer after being given assurances both by H Limited and by the employers that he would not lose any of his accrued service benefits and that his employment would be treated as continuous since 1948. So a, a contractual agreement to that effect preserving continuity all the way back to 1948. And then he was made redundant but was only given a payment based on five years work. And the question was whether he should be entitled to an additional payment under what was then known um, as the um, Redundancy Payments Act 1965. And that had um, a requirement for continuity of service therein for that payment. And Lord Wilberforce <coughs> deals with um, his construction of the Redundancy Payments Act um, at, um, so we see um, uh, 710H, um, which is on page 272, and over the page at the top of 273, his construction of that statute which was um, uh, applying only to the case of one employer, that is the dismissing employer, and does no more than to relieve the employee in such a case of the necessity to prove continuity. So that was his construction. And then we get the, the, his grappling of the contractual uh, agreement as to continuity at 273, B273, at D, E and F, you see the number of paragraphs there. Um, Your Honour, and um, um, just bear with me. The can I read that, please? Yes.
It's three then that you're relying on. Yes. Okay. And um, uh, basically, the parties can't, by agreement, confer a continuous service, and nor can the employer be stopped from denying continuous service where the statutory test is not met. What matters are the plain words of the statutes and whether they're met on the facts rather than what may the parties may have contractually agreed to be the position. And that then deals with that interaction between the statutory rights and the employment law. Do they apply? When do they apply? And what may have been agreed by the parties in the uh, contractual matrix between them. And so I think if I just finish off, I think Article 66 is a provision we haven't yet looked at, which is okay. on the entitlement to gratuity. And um, if you um, go to B28, I have that, thank you. And um, the, uh, I think it's important to um, identify that the, the qualifying scheme commencement date is a term that's defined um, in the employment law um, in um, paragraph three of Schedule One. And 38, B38 has that definition. Sorry, say again, paragraph. Paragraph um, three of Schedule One, the table of de defined terms, defines qualifying scheme commencement date on page B38. Thank you. Um, any one of the following, whichever is applicable, and it's B here that's engaged, the date of employment for an employee who is not an exempt employee employed on or after the 1st of February 2020. That's the claimant and he's not an exempt employee. Just for uh, your, your honour's comfort, exempt employee is defined at B37 at the top there. Uh, and none of those circumstances apply to the claimant. That's uncontroversial. Sorry, take, sorry, take me through it again. So, so it's, um, it's, it's, it's Sorry, it's uh, forgive me. I was trying to note it up on the <laughs> on the case lines. It didn't work, so you'll just have to run me through it again. Okay. Qualifying scheme commencement date. It is yeah, being engaged, but you, you you then see that term exempt employee is not yeah. an exempt employee. Just for com for completeness. Yeah. Exempt employee is defined at the top of B thirty seven. Uh, B37, yeah, okay. And it, this is uncontroversial, but none of those circumstances do apply to the claimants A, B, C, D, and E. So he is not an exempt employee. And therefore, when one is count, um, uh, counting um, continuous employment, uh, one is looking at um, completion of continuous employment of at least one year. Um, after um, the date of his employment, which was the 11th of January 2021, um, until the termination of his employment. And so, as will be absolutely clear, that is less than one year's continuous employment. And so there is no um, entitlement to gratuity. My, my learned friend argues that the rate of dues, that is the DIFC employee workplace savings plan, somehow 
gives him um, the continuous employment. Uh, uh, and, and we respectfully submit that's neither here nor there for the purposes of calculating continuity of employment with the defendant on termination. It's irrelevant that he was paid dues at a higher rate. Um, there's nothing on the face of Article 66.1 that remotely suggests that that's a relevant factor in the determination of continuous employment. And as I've already submitted, contractual recognition of continuous services is relevant for the purposes of the statutory concept of continuity. And we rely by analogy on global elastic threat and Lord Wilberforce's reasoning therein. And I've already given you our position, no associated employer. So Ms. Malik's arguments that one can stitch in the language of um, Section 231 of the U is, is not, as a, it's just a non-starter. And so therefore we're in a very straightforward position where applying the statute, the statutory definition of employer, the continuity of employment with the defendant is less than 12 months prior to termination, so no entitlement to gratuity and no associated penalties either. And so to rate all of these submissions back, this is a grasp the nettle case on a point of construction of the employment law and the terms therein. And we respectfully submit that uh, the claim is right either for a strikeout of those relevant paragraphs or an immediate judgment in respect of those paragraphs. So unless I can assist you on any further, those are the defendant's submissions on the application. Thank you very much and uh, uh, very helpful indeed. Thank you. I'm grateful. So Ms. Malley. Thank you, sir. I'm grateful. Um, uh, sorry, Your Honour, not sir. Um, used to the UK tribunals. Uh, Your Honour, I'm going to respond to some of the points that are made by my learned friend and I'm grateful for the indication that you have had an opportunity to go through both sides' arguments. But in essence, if we, if you like, cut to the chase and go straight to what Article um, 4.1 uh, says and what the, the provision is in respect of um, my client's ability to bring this case. Uh, Article 4.1, which you've already been taken to, um, sets out that, and the only requirement is, an employee has to be based within or ordinarily working within the DIFC, or, or, or that the contract provides for the application of DIFC law. That's all that is required to satisfy the requirement to be an employee. And I don't think it's a dispute between the parties that Article 4 uh, uh, enables my client to to bring the claim, certainly from my learned friend's perspective, from 11th of January 2021, because it's being accepted at that stage, he falls within the jurisdiction of the DRC. The cause of action he's bringing on the 11th of January 2021, or uh, sorry, after 11th of January 2021, when uh, he's terminated, um, is a continuing course of discrimination. And by necessary implication, he has to rely on a continuous act going backwards. The cause of action doesn't change at the time he's an employee and he's recognised to be an employee. So, so are, are you saying, are you saying this, that once he's an employee, yes. uh, a, 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 he is able to bring a claim under the employment law? Oh. Um, some of the facts that he needs to establish in relation to that claim occurred before he became an employee for the purpose of the employment law. Correct. But does that mean that when it comes to remedy, um, that he can get a remedy for anything that occurred before he became an employee? Yes, and that's because the very nature of the continuing act necessitates that he goes backwards. And the point that was made about the DIFC law 
applying retrospectively um, uh, kicks in. The last act he can That's actually on... what you're arguing is not that it applies retrospectively. Um, what 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 you're saying is it applies now, uh, and that as of today, I have been the victim of um, several Sorry, years of discrimination. You, Sorry. Yeah, it's cutting out. It just froze for a second. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Now. Yeah. OK, so what you're saying is I have a cause of action under the DIFC law because I'm an employee uh, uh, within the meaning of the DIFC law. Um, uh, and um, I have been the victim of several years of discrimination. Correct. Um, which he has to he has to uh, establish. But. Is that. Is that a retrospective application of the DIFC law? Or is that saying, I am here today, the victim of several years, and I am today seeking redress for it? It can be either or, and, and, and Your Honour, that's the point. When my learned friend talks a lot about statutory interpretation and, and half the skeleton argument is devoted to that, He's not gone so far as to say what words should be imported for this to make any sense. We say you don't need to do that. We say if you are an employee under the employment law, as he is under Article 4.1, and you have a cause of action recognising the DFC employment law, and that's um, uh, uh, 61.3 um, at page uh, B25, which talks about for the purposes of Article 61 to a, any conduct extending over a period is to be treated as done at the end of that Sorry, period. Sorry, give me the give me the reference again. Yeah, it's uh, the the authorities bundle, which is bundle B, and yeah. it's page twenty five of that bundle. Yeah. Paragraph sixty one three. Let me 61. just so let me th this is important. Let me just get to it. Don't don't take yeah. it too quickly. So B. 25, I've got 61.3. For the purposes of 61.2a, which 61.2a says a court shall not consider a claim unless brought to the court before the end of a period of six months, beginning with the later date on which the law comes into force or where a complaint satisfies the court. And the date of the act to which the complaint relates. OK. Sorry, I'm going to just have to highlight. 61.3a. Yeah, the conduct ending over the period is to be treated to be done at the end of the period. But the period is six months there. Yeah, that, that's for time limit purposes, that the, the conduct is, for, for my client's purposes, we say that the dismissal is tainted by discrimination. Yes. The conduct, that's the act, it's tainted by discrimination. And therefore, for limitation periods, uh, the conduct takes place at, the, uh, at that stage. And you can go backwards in time to marry up for a continuing act all of the allegations of discrimination that he has faced with the bank. And I'll come to talk to you about my learned friend's um, cherry picking of, of when the bank is the employer or the branch is the employer. But simply on the law and the purposes of the law, what Article 4 says, Article 4, if my learned friend's position is that there has to be some kind of wording imported of a material time, so an employee has to fall within Article 4.1 at a material time, when is that material time? Is it when they are an employee? Is it when they are in the jurisdiction? Or is it when the acts are complained of? None of that is put into the legislation. The legislation is clear, and, and Your Honour, I know even though my learned friend spent a long time talking about the interpretation, it's something you do day in, day out. You give flavour to a statute by looking at the facts of a case. And we know that all kind of legislative interpretation takes on board public policy. When the DIFC employment law is enacted for the protection of employees and employers, and indeed at the beginning of the law, and I'll take you to a couple of provisions which will assist. Um, if we look at B4, um, again, sorry, just, just, again, sorry, just 
Slow down slightly. Slow down. I'm sorry. Uh, B4, the authorities bundle B4, paragraph yeah. 3. Yes. Which sets out the purpose of the law. So without going to statutory interpretation, let's look at what the legislature said the purpose of DIFC employment law was. It's to provide minimum employment standards for employees, to promote fair treatment, and to foster employment practices that contribute to prosperity. And that's exactly why, Your Honour, if I may then invite you to look at um, page uh, B7. Clause 11. To A. Yeah. The arguments my learned friend makes about not being able to import any statutory concepts into a contractual definition. Are out the window when the law itself says Nothing in the law precludes an employee from providing in any contract terms and conditions that are more favourable to an employee than those required by this law. My learned friend's argument appears to be continuity is given simply for maintaining, and his own words and in his skeleton argument, service related benefits or policies and he talks of redundancy. The problem he has with that uh, with respect is the redundancy policy that applied to my client and we raise as an act of discrimination in any event and uh, is found at A13 of the bundle. Okay let's have a look at that. Is it right? Yes. What do we get in for? So it's referred to at A13 of the bundle, which is uh, the, is that the right? Okay, I, I mean, I, I've read and I get, I've read the witness statements and I read the pleadings. Uh, I, I get it that it's your case that he was set up essentially uh, it, and, and sent off, sent off to Dubai when he thought that he would be protected by uh, a continuity of service and then found himself in a less advantageous uh, position with regard to redundancy when he was terminated than he thought he, he would be. I mean, that's a flavour that I get from it, it goes further. Statement. It goes further. My learned friend's proposition to this court is continuity means we were trying to protect service related benefits. OK, by the redundancy, however, the redundancy policy for Dubai or for my client, and we say it was made for my client, didn't kick in till May 2021. And it, we say it was manufactured for him. So when they're trying to protect and they refer to continuous employment within the contract, with the greatest of respect, if the only protection was supposed to be for end of service, two points arise. What is end of service benefit or dues? It begs the question that if it's not an end of service or a service related policy, what is it? You can't get around the construction of saying, we're going to have an internal redundancy procedure that we want to give him the benefit of for longevity, but he can't import any con uh, statutory provisions in. The statutory provision is end of service and dues. And my friend is wholly wrong in relation to, it makes no difference that we gave him 8.33% uh, because we all know that if we look at the law, and again, I ask you to go to. Um, I'm sorry, um, you're taking this far too quickly for me. You, you, you know this case inside out. Um, you know, I'm. You, you're losing me on. on I'm your sorry. Arguments. I apologise. If we go <laughs> to um, 29 B29. Okay. Again, it's the law, the employment law. Yes. Two points arise. Uh, are you there, Your Honour? Yes, I am. I'm grateful. So you'll see um, at uh, B29, uh, sorry, at B29 7, 
Yes, so that's article, let me just get the full citation there. So that's article 66, seven, yeah, Correct. okay. Correct, 66, seven. Yeah. 5.83% is paid for the qualifying scheme commencement. This is the, the argument of the, uh, the, the due scheme. For yes. the five years of an employee service, and 8.33 is paid for each additional year of service. And that's okay. that 7AB. And my client was paid 833. Okay, so he was no, I, no, I, yeah, OK. That's, uh, under the statutory provision, and my friend, I think, made the argument that there's nothing to say that the 833 was recognising his service under statute or otherwise. Well, it absolutely. So 8.33 is only payable after? Requisite service after the qualifying service of uh, five, years. five years. And to draw the analogy under the old scheme and still what applies on shore is for the first five years of employment, an employee is paid 21 days of end of service gratuity. You don't and have to worry me about that. I will just come to you. Just draw the analogy. But yes, the okay. That actually it was, it, you can't ever import statutory protection through the continuative employment that we've agreed in the contract and the only reason it was agreed in the contract was to protect him for service related benefits the the argument with the greatest so it's a, it's a major so i mean just trying to get it clear in my own mind it, it a major issue between uh, you and Mr. Kemp is that Mr. Kemp says the statutory scheme overrides the contractual and you say the contractual overrides the statutory. Absolutely. Well, I say no, not only does a contractual override the statutory, the, 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 the statutory itself um, allows. Yes, you, it, allows. It, yes. I mean, but for no, no, no. I, I mean, on the face of it, the authorities would indicate that but for that saving in the statute, you would the, the the statute says what it says, uh, and that's it. But but you say in answer to that, well, yes, that may be the case. But in this statute, yes, this statute says that in fact the priority is that the contractual agreements, if more favourable to the employee, will take effect in priority to his statutory rights. Absolutely. And that actually goes back to why the employment law was put into place to begin with. As you know, uh, uh, Your Honour, working out here that the DIFC's vision is to drive itself as a future of finance in the region. In the purpose of the employment laws I've already taken you to, it's set out clearly that they want to ensure equal treatment, they want to ensure there's a, uh, uh, the DIFC's on the map, if you like. And putting that into its context, we say, and it goes away, it does away with the whole kind of need to have statutory interpretation in any event. Um, large entities in the DIFC, financial entities, need to be able to attract the best expat candidates. Of course, this is a nuance of this jurisdiction where 90% of the population is made up of the expats. In order to attract those expats and to create this financial centre, the employment protection that's given or that's negotiated um, at the time of entry is hugely relevant because unlike the UK and we've been taken to case law which talks about whether it's associated employers or continuous service there's a codified regime in the UK under the Employment Rights Act which tells you what continuity of service means and there's lots of case law on it there is no case in the DIFC that tells us what does continuity mean for a person in the same circumstances as my client. A person who has worked for the same entity over a number of years, is a managing director, is bought in and he negotiated his contract, as you see from our skeleton, they're not standard terms, to preserve that continuity for a reason. And with the greatest of respect to my learned friend, that reason was not simply so he got a, a higher redundancy package. It's to preserve his rights as an employee. Because otherwise it's tantamount to saying, we preserve your continuity of service, but with what and with who? 
because you're not preserving continuity with the DIFC branch of commerce because you can't, it didn't exist. You're preserving the continuity with commerce AG. And just to take that point further, Your Honour, I'd like to take you to the documents my learned friend took you to, the offer and the, the, um, uh, the, the contract and the termination, because again, the discrepancy and the interchangeable way that the uh, defendant views themselves is highlighted. And if we look at A38, which is a document you've already been taken to, and I'm going to compare that with A46. Okay, just bear with me a second. A38. Feel free to slow me down at any point, I'm sorry. I will do, don't you worry. Okay, I have it. So, A38, we are pleased to offer you employment with commas A DIFC branch. And if we go further down on uh, the third line, in this letter and the handbook, the bank means the bank with all its subsidiaries, which of course includes DIFC. No, it doesn't. Well, with all of the its... The DIFC, DIFC is not a subsidiary. No, no, so, so, sorry, but it, it means a comma, it means commas as in the, the entity commas. The, what it um, means, what it means is the totality, totality of the bank. Yeah. The totality and if you just pause there and you if you if you go further down the bank is referred to throughout your normal place will of work this up uh, paragraph one will be the bank's premises in the difc so that's in the difc that's your normal place of work but you may have to travel overseas of course when we look at the termination and if you go to a46 the definition. Sorry, but forgive me. Where do we see banks' premises? A forty six. Sorry, where do we see banks' premises in the DIFC? Uh, uh, under appointment, you shall be appointed to, under appointment. That's paragraph one, page yeah. eight thirty eight. You're appointed with Normal the place that I have it. Yes, sorry, yeah. just, uh, just although you last. will be required to work at such place and undertake such travel as may be required to perform your duties. Okay, well, have course, it. right. And if you then look, and we've looked at the definition of what bank is, commerce and the totality of commerce, if you like. But if we then compare that to 46, A46. Yeah. Suddenly, the bank is defined as the DFC branch. Where do we see that? Oh, and yes. And throughout, it's just, it's, so when it suits them to say, the bank, when we offered you employment and you entered into the contract, the express understanding of the parties was the bank is commas AG and all its totality. But when we dismiss you, we're dismissing you using a, a definition of bank to be simply DIFC. It doesn't work. And the same analogy is drawn, Your Honour, in terms of how they interpret the continuity point which we've already looked at continuity with the bank it can only be with the bank it can't ever be with dfc continuity to simply allow you to have better service benefits but that doesn't mean end of service gratuity or the qualifying scheme because that's a statutory benefit what we mean they say is an internal benefit that doesn't work either because not only does on the face of the, the, the language or the construction, if they are, as, as, as my learned friend says, only using continuity for service related or, or uh, service policies, end of service gratuity or dues is exactly that. It's service related and they recognised it and it's statutory. The law doesn't assist them because the employment law allows the parties to, if you like, extend the protection. So whereas a uh, one year service may be required under the law to fit within the end of service gratuity or the due scheme, that can be superseded by the agreement of the parties where the continuity of employment is imported. The continuity of employment means that from the date my client entered the DFC branch, he already had continued service and he was already entitled to that payment. That's our argument. He doesn't have to do it yet there. And the parties are free to contract to that degree because a law allows them to do that. 
A law allows them to have more favourable terms than those required by this law. Article um, 11 2A, which I've already taken you to. Yes. So in terms of the, and, and uh, a crucial point in terms of continuity, which also isn't grappled with, is continuity of employment is not a concept that the DIFC law has dealt with. And to refer to English authority, we in a we in an um, uh, alternative submission submitted. Let's look at what associated employers are, and if you start looking at associated employers, on do yeah. You, I mean, your problem your problem with that is the very court of appeal case you, yeah. you referred me to. Um, court of appeal made it perfectly clear that you can't supplement substantive law. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and that the waterfall provision is about is about conflict of laws, not about supplementing. And we agree. It was just put forward, you'll see in the scouts argument, my friend says that's our position, it's not. It was put forward as an alternative. Why? Because English law makes provision for definition of continuous service and the statutory framework in English law gives the court a complete answer to what continuous service is. But the DIFC law doesn't define any notion of continuous service. And therefore, in our submission, the parties, as they have done here, are completely at liberty within their contracts to define and make provision for that continuity of service in the contractual documentation. They're allowed to. And it's not a matter, with respect to my learned friend, that the, 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 the um, test, as you, you're well aware of, and I don't need to take you to them for immediate uh, uh, judgment or strikeout has to be that it's such a um, obvious point on law or, or that you don't need to, even the way it's pleaded, you don't need to go into any of the facts or otherwise it's a straight knockout slam dunk. It's absolutely not. Not only is it our decided authority, but the, author the, the, the um, law that applies doesn't, doesn't suggest that my client at the time he brings the claim doesn't have the requisite either continuity or but aren't those issues aren't those issues of pure aren't those issues of pure law? No, because a continuous act of discrimination, Your Honour, by its necessary nature and the case law sets out, whether it's Hendricks or otherwise, you need to look at the facts. You need no, to no, look but, uh, but forgive me. Let, let's just be a bit more analytical about it. I accept that if I were persuaded mm. that you took your client as you find him in the DIFC with yeah. a history of discrimination, then the facts of that history are relevant. The question is, as a matter of law, can I do that? Can I look at the facts prior to the Jan prior to January uh, of um, 2021 in um, in assessing his cause of action that he brings as he's entitled to and it's recognized he's entitled to post January 21. Yes, because our position is that at the time he brings the cause of action, he's an employee, the cause of action doesn't change. The cause of action is a continuing act of discrimination by necessary implication. But isn't that a, isn't that a, isn't that a, a question of law as to whether or not one can define that um, uh, continuing uh, discrimination by reference to to matters prior to his employment in the DISC under the employment law? And isn't That's that a pure point of law? Um, the uh, I, I, it's it's a point of law in terms of w whether you can decide that can or cannot happen, but to determine whether there are a continuous course of act, you would need to to open up the facts, as you know. But in 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 respect of whether the act itself can go before two thousand and twenty one relies on the proposition or the inference which my friend is is learned friend is asking you to make, which is. Um, DIFC law simply cannot apply before that date. We disagree with that because the nature of any continuing act necessitates to go backwards in time. And we agree that DIFC law is applicable from 11th of January and my clients agree to be subject to DIFC law 
from 11th of January. But what we disagree with is that he agrees to be subject to that law only from that date. The inference that the uh, my learned friend wants you to 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 withdraw, uh, sorry, to draw is that DIFC law simply cannot apply before the time he's under a contract with, uh, of uh, of employment with a DIFC employer, and we say but that. But there are two. There are two. There are two different concepts here. Uh, and one is more problematical for you than the other. The the less problematical one for you is, as I say, that that you assess the victim of continuing um, uh, continuing discrimination on the last date, yeah. and if you do that, then that date is when he is an employee in the DIFC right. and the defendants have no argument to counter that because they accept that he is uh, an employee and he is subject to the DIFC law. They have an argument as, as to whether they were responsible uh, for, for the discrimination or another entity, but that's a, that's a, that's a fact sensitive issue. Um, the more difficult position for you, and I want to see whether, I just want to investigate whether you really maintain it, is that um, in a much broader sense, once um, the D once he's an employee within the DIFC and having regard to the terms of his employ uh, contract employment, you can retrospectively apply DIFC law to his previous employment. And Your Honour, my, my position on that will be found at uh, the letter at A43. OK. Paragraph 20, which has already been referred to. Well, let's go to that again. Yeah. The contract of employment governed by laws of DIFC, you submit to the jurisdiction in the event of dispute, which I, I, I appreciate is not defined what dispute means. You agree any action, any action against the bank may only be brought in the DIFC. The that's, a jurisdic that's a jurisdiction yeah. point. But he, he, uh, uh, the, the point is that at the time he brings the action, the action, uh, the DIFC courts have jurisdiction, and that's not con uh, controversial. He brings a continuing course of discrimination action. And the net effect of what my learned friend's position seems to be is you can only look at whatever the continuing course was between the day he entered the DIFC and, and the end. We, we can't say anything about that. We say that can't be correct because that's not what the law says. The law says to be an employee, you need to f fulfill Article 4.1, he does. At the time he brings his action, he falls under the jurisdiction of the DIFC courts. And there's nothing in DIFC law, uh, either interpreted or, or a case law, that has talked about the extraterritorial effect, if you like, of the DIFC law, if that's, if that's the, the, the question, to acts going backwards in a continuing act of discrimination matter. And it's an important point. Your Honour, we have looked into the, a similar analogy if there was something, and it, and it would be before you today, if, for example, there was a case in the UK where an individual bought a claim, let's say... Uh, the, I mean, you, you're addressing the continuing act point, which is fine. But it's the other, it's, it's, it's the other submission that, that I'm really concerned about. The submission, unless I've misunderstood it, that once the DIFC court has jurisdiction. Yeah. Um, and this is, as I have said, a, a, a continuous contract of employment, which is amended and restated from time to time. Yeah. Yeah. Then the DIFC court has jurisdiction to um, determine claims relating to periods under that contract, which uh, the, the 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 facts surrounding which occurred prior to him coming to the DIFC. So right. that that is a, that is a different issue than saying he has a cause of action in the DIFC which is continuing. And as a matter of statutory construction, um, you take 
that you, 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 you take that period of continuity as ending at the, uh, at, at the date when he brings the claim in the DIFC. I see that point. Um, because the other point becomes more complicated because if you have, if the DRC does have court does have exclusive jurisdiction over his relationship um, with, with the bank, let's assume it's the totality of the bank, then arguably you should be bringing claims under English law and Singaporean law in these proceedings. Uh, Your Honour, that's if the view is taken that there's a the contract of employment is with the bank and that each time he's gone from, say, Singapore or London or be transferred to different jurisdictions, the local law applies. Um, the problem in, in and, and again, it's the factual and the legal, the legal concept coming together. The problem in saying, and I'm just thinking out loud, well, English law should apply or Singaporean law should apply, is one law should apply to what determines the continuing act, whether it's happened in England or within um, Singapore, if you're with me, that the uh, uh, time he brings the action, he's entitled to bring it because of each time he's moved jurisdiction, it's just a variation of terms of contracts of employment. It's not a new contract that's entered into. It's a variation of his terms. And so that's so you're not, you're not the then contending for any retrospectivity? No, we're saying that it, 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 it's we're saying that at the time he brings the claim, DIFC law applies, and DIFC law can determine the the continuing acts going backwards because that's the only law that can apply at that stage. To say that those acts should be looked at under English law or Singaporean law, uh, and I stand to be corrected, Your Honour, I'm not sure that works. Because what then we're asking the DFC court to do is to take jurisdiction for an employee who has the right to bring a claim as at the date of dismissal for a continuing act, look at the continuing act from the date he starts with DFC under DFC law, but then allow, and it goes to what the construction, I guess, of employer would be, which again, will need you to, to go into fact sensitive of how the bank set up, how it's governed, you know, who the correct entity is and, and what the governing law for that entity ought to be. But on our construction, the DIFC law needs to be applied going backwards. I don't see a position, and again, uh, Your Honour, it's because we're on novel grounds in any event, how you can um, apply English or Singaporean law to those acts going backwards, given when he leaves the jurisdictions, those laws don't apply anymore to the contract. The very terms and conditions only allow him to apply DIFC law. But you're talking to acute, well, it depends whether you interpret um, Clause 20 uh, as an exclusive jurisdiction clause, yeah. uh, well, and whether you, inter whether you interpret um, the bank to mean the totality of the bank, which and is so what that he and so that his only right of redress as of today yes. for any claim against the totality of the bank is to bring proceedings before this court. Correct, and that's what 20 says, we say, uh, shall be governed. So if that's right, if that's right, um, then surely if he had any accrued cause of action before he came to the DIFC, are you saying that that accrued cause of action just disappears? Or are you saying that he has the right to bring that action before the yes. DIFC court? Right. It doesn't disappear. He has the right to bring that accrued cause of action. And well, there would be an accrued cause of action under English law or under Singaporean law. Well, or under uh, DIFC law, because anything that's taken... Well, how could he have an accrued cause of action before he became an employee under the contract right. which provides for, for because DIFC? Because say the material time when the, the cause of action doesn't change. The cause of action is continuing act of discrimination. That is no, that's, no, that's not right. The, 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 sorry, you're you're confusing the the two different the two different scenarios. Let's put to one side. I understand entirely, and it's very straightforward. That okay, he's got a claim for continuing um, uh, for for uh, 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 continuing discrimination. You take him as you find him. 
within the DIFC, and uh, and you look at the history uh, that has contributed to that um, that continuing cause of action, you take it as the last day. So DIFC court has jurisdiction. Everybody accepts it's an employee um, employed in the DIFC and, and uh, under the employment law. Dead straightforward. Now this is more complicated. The question then is if one interprets as you do um, 20, clause 20 of his contract of employment as a submission to the exclusive jurisdiction of the DIFC course for all and any claims against the bank in its widest sense, because that's how it's defined in that document, then it must be right on your case that he would have had accrued rights of action stretching back to his times of employment in England and in Singapore, which existed prior to any cause of action that he had under DIFC law. And if that's right, then the submission in clause 20 means that this court would have jurisdiction over those accrued rights. Correct. That, that's entirely correct. So, and thank you for putting it so succinctly. That's what we're saying. We say you do have that jurisdiction over those accrued rights. And, and again, without marrying the two and you know, the difference between the, the, the kind and of... That's not the way you phrased your claim. Uh, and that's why you're, you're a judge and I'm not, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that's the, the essence of what we've said, that the, he's entitled to bring the claim and he's entitled, the DFC courts are entitled to look at uh, the, those accrued causes from his employment as a totality with the bank. And that necessitates you to look at who the employer is, if you like, the bank, and look at the definitions that have been given. And that's why, again, it lends weight to the fact that to say that this is a matter which can simply be struck out because it's so obviously wrong, the very fact that we have all of these um, uh, debates between ourselves, all three, and my learned friend has also conceded, well, it's some points are moot points and some points are, you know, it, it, it remain to be decided, or I'm saying that, that there is no clear-cut answer or law, tells you why this application is devoid of merit. It's not a case that you could just look at and say, Miss Malik, this is so bad, your claim, that I, I know that I can strike this out. And just to give an analogy, if, for example, and, and again, I'm just going to go back to the UK law, somebody presents to you a claim for unfair dismissal with six months service, it doesn't matter how bad the treatment or otherwise might be, it's a straightforward strike out because it's never going to get off the ground because by a point of law, it can't. But this action that's before you and all the nuances that are uh, arising in the debate we're having tells you exactly why it's not uh, right for for a, 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 a immediate judgment or strike out. But I mean, Mr. Mr. Kemp would say, I think, and he'll tell me in a moment when I give him a right to reply. But I think I think Mr. Kemp would say, well, if there are causes of action under Singaporean uh, and uh, under English law, you should have brought them. Your client should have brought them in Singapore uh, and and in England. And that presupposes, and I'm with you, if there was a discreet act of discrimination that ought to have been brought then. Nobody when they're in Singapore or in London, my client least of, would have known there'd be a continuing course of conduct. So we're in separate territory, in separate water. I wouldn't be here before you today if there was one act of discrimination in London that I wanted to test before the DFC court. But the very nature of the continuing act means that at the time that the allegation or the at the time the treatment is 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 given, the individual either brings a claim for discrimination or when it's all married up together, there's a continuing act. So at well, that can time, we, can we look at can we look at the pleading in terms of the acts that you rely upon or your client relies yes. upon? Uh, the, the claim for the, the particulars, the, the particulars of claim, I think, uh, are probably it's the best place to start. <laughs> Tab three of um, uh, a, the A bundle, uh, A6. Yeah. If yeah. you can give give me an A number, that would be A6. helpful. A6, Your Honour. That's the, the start of the particular. A6. Well, let's let's just have a little look at this because, um, I mean, I've read these and um, 
Uh, obviously, as pleaded, they are uh, serious allegations. Um, so, yes, I think page A11. Sorry, I'm still working from a paper copy, I'm also. That's OK, so. Uh, but it's section five, isn't it, of the particulars of claim that, that, that pleads the, the, the relevant acts. We've got 2013, 2015, 16, 17, 17, 18, 19. And then there's whistleblowing throughout 20, and that's also uh, tainted with discrimination. 20, but all of this, all of this is prior to his commencement of employment with uh, in the DIFC. Right. But put together is a continuing act of discrimination. We know, and there's no dispute between the parties, it's all prior to his commencement. But the question for the court is, uh, the claim in essence is there's an inherent discriminatory regime he's subject to throughout the course of his employment with the bank. At the time that these allegations or the, these, um, not allegations, the, the, these in incidents took place, if one were to look at them in isolation now, yes, they would be time barred under the relevant jurisdictions. But that's the whole point of the continuing, uh, continuing act, that the limitation period starts from the last act complained of and goes backward in time because we uh, show a nexus between all of the acts. So. For that purpose, if your question is, well, at the relevant time, whether it be in London or Singapore, when this act took place, does he lose his right under a limitation or statute to have bought the claim then? If it was a discrete act, yes, but not where it's a continuing act of discrimination, because by its very nature, a continuing act marries up and disbars the, 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 the primary limitation periods because it shows this continuing chain of discrimination he's been subject to throughout the course of his employ with the bank. And I'm going to call the bank in inverted commas because that's something the court needs to grapple with as well in terms of what the bank is. So, Your Honour, it, it's absolutely correct that uh, uh, when you identify that in 2013 or 15 or 17 or 18, he's not at the DFC, these allegations take place. If they were individual discrete allegations, I'd understand the point, but these we say, and the way the, the claim is pleaded, all marry up to show this continuing course, which he then has the right to bring in the DIFC court under Article 20 of his contract of employment, because at the time he raises continuing course, the jurisdiction is there and you have to go backwards and you have to go back into the jurisdictions he worked in because he worked for the bank as a totality and any artificial distinction and again if it assists if i take you back to the um uh, contract or the offer letter uh if i take you to please uh page um uh where's i see a four uh, we've got 43 in front of me. I'm going to take to the correct one. It's A40, um, A, A, A39, sorry. A39. When we talk about the different jurisdictions and the statutory regimes that may have applied during the course of discrete allegations, that doesn't kick in by the time he's in the DFC because even on their own construction, if you look at paragraph four, your previous employment with Commerce, and they don't say Commerce Singapore or Commerce London, they say your previous employment with Commerce, full stop, commenced on 1st of November and should be recognised. So we say that that previous employment is not centric simply to Singapore or laws or to, to uh, uh, London laws. They're recognising a totality of service which then, by the contract, enables him to bring the claim to the jurisdiction of the DFC. And it doesn't matter that these acts took place when he was employed in either Singapore or in London. The DIFC courts had the jurisdiction. Yeah, I mean, there are two, there, there, there are different concepts here. So there's jurisdiction, which is one thing, but there's also cause of action and yeah. cause of action under the DIFC employment law. Yes. And. So Mr. Kemp's argument is that you cannot have a cause of action under the DISC employment law unless and until 
the respective parties are employer and employee under that law. Uh, and they were not employee and employer under that law uh, until 20, until the 1st of January 2021. Um, uh, and so leaving aside the issue of, of the continuity and the date and, and the final date, leaving that aside, um, he would say uh, anything that occurred prior to 2021 was not done in the context of the relationship under the employment law and therefore there is no cause of action under the employment law and there may have been causes of action under different laws but that's not the point this is a claim that's brought uh, under the employment law um, but the employment law doesn't say that the employment law doesn't say that you can't bring it where does it say that that's what we invite him to to, to tell us or where to does say it say what see it's the employment law doesn't say the, the employment law doesn't say that my client can't bring actions to the to the DIFC court when he identifies a cause of action he has. It doesn't say that he has to have physically been an employee or he has to have had a contract of employment to bring that action. No, no, no. I, I, and I don't think that's a problem. So, for example, I gave the example before of a tortious injury. Yeah. Uh, I, I take very little persuading yeah. on the words of, of um, clause 20 yeah. that you know, if a fellow employee had injured him in December of, of, of 2020, he couldn't bring a he couldn't bring proceedings in relation to that tortious claim before this court on the pure contractual construction right. that's fine so his cause of action there would be in tort or, right. or, or law of obligations as, 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 as one would call it in the DIFC what is more difficult is a cause of action under the employment law because that's a statutory cause of action which requires the parties to be in defined in a defined relationship and that defined relationship did not exist prior to the 1st of January 2021. That's the point that's taken against you. But the cause of action, um, and I, I don't want to repeat the point. I'm no, no, no. I, I, we can leave, the leave to one side. At the end of the period, it comes, the cause of action. That's fine. That's get that, fine. I get that point entirely. And um, in terms of, uh, sorry, you, you said that at the time that. Um, uh, the acts took place, there was, he wasn't subject to... Uh, yeah, I'm just, what I'm trying to isolate is this. I get entirely the argument about the end of the period. Yeah. What I'm trying to isolate is, is whether that's your only argument or whether you have a broader argument. Because if you have a broader argument, then Mr Kemp's point seems to kick in. So I want to know your answer to that. As to why the DFC courts should take jurisdiction. Not jurisdiction. It isn't about jurisdiction. Sorry, it's about cause of action. It's about cause of, cause of action. Cause of action. Sorry for the cause of action. Because the um, the article, even within the law, says additional rights can be given than those provided in this law. The question is, does does that mean additional rights under the law, which are provided for in the contract? and whether that concept of continuity allows him. OK, that, those, then I, yes, then I, then I do rights. understand the point. Yeah, so, so it's an additional point, right the additional to continuity. Right, absolutely, because the law I took you to at the outset, which says that you can contract, if you like contract out of the law, you can always give employees more than this law allows. Part of giving employees more is enabling that law to apply at that period. It's, it's got to be correct because that's what the the um, uh, uh, the contract when it's read properly uh, has been negotiated uh, uh, to read and, and, and let's be clear this was a contract that was negotiated not with the greatest respect with a bakery it's a it's a sophisticated not that bakeries can't um, negotiate contracts but with a sophisticated bank worldwide bank with um, in-house counsel no doubt and, and and lawyers and if they wanted to carve anything out it absolutely would have been done the law doesn't help my learned friend. The law allows the parties 
to give more favorable terms to the employee, which we say is exactly happened here. Case law, we invite the, the, the courts to, to, to actually give some decision on a person in this position for a matter of public policy, this case ought to go forward. There's no authorities any of the practitioners here can certainly rely on to understand a remedy that's now given in the DFC law, for example, how is that even tested? So I'm going to invite you on all of those points and looking at it, it's telling that my friend hasn't really bothered within his skeleton or his submissions to go into the, 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 the tests for strike out or immediate uh, judgment because they don't wash in a continuing course of uh, discrimination. I think that's an unfair submission. I think, I, think, I, think, I think both of you have pretty much agreed the tests for, um, uh, that, for that, summary that, judgment. That's our submission, sir. But, uh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, in the UK tribunals, we always say, sir, and I need to get used to employment judges are your honour in the DFC. Um, well, I'm, I'm not an employment judge. Well, you are today. So. Yeah. Um, so, Your Honour, if I may assist you no further, if you want to hear on any of the other points, I'm, I'm happy to do so. But I think uh, the points are, are, are made. I'm not, I've not taken you to our witness statements. I've not taken you to our skeleton because I know you will have read into those and I know you will ask me what you want to know about. OK. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Right. Uh, Mr Kemp, you have um, a right to reply. Uh, you are, I want to make, um, I think, three brief points by way of reply. Um, yeah. The first one is dealing with the continuing conduct point. Um, the second is dealing with the Article 11 2A terms and conditions and contract points. And then finally, Article 66. So those are the three points of reply. Okay. Um, and so looking at um, the conduct extending over a period, um, so I'm in um, B25, um, Article 61.3. Okay, sorry, I have it, yes. So um, these are the enforcement provisions in the um, uh, employment law, and we have there the reference um, for the purposes of Article 61.2a, in other words, for limitation purposes, conduct extending over a period is to be treated as done at the end of the period. Now, the reference there to conduct in my respectful submission can only mean conduct within the scope of Part 9. That is because um, Article 61 uh, is a set of enforcement provisions in respect to proceedings under Part 9. And the provisions in Part 9, which start on page B23 in Article 59, which I took you to earlier, can only apply if um, the definitions of employer and employee are met. That is the only tenable construction in my respectful submission to the law, that you can only go as far back as the point when the parties became an employer and an employee within the meaning of the law. There's simply no warrant in the terms of the statute to go back further to when the parties were working in Singapore under Singapore law or in London under English and Welsh law. So that's our position on the continuing um, conduct point. Um, the next point is about Article 11 to 8. And um, uh, so that is on B7. Um, and in, uh, nothing in this law precludes an employer from providing in any employment contract terms and conditions that are more favourable to an employee than those required by this law. Pausing there, there's no contractual entitlement to gratuity or penalty here. That's uh, the point. There's no um, uh, term and condition in the contract about um, uh, protection from discrimination. Um, and so this uh, article really adds nothing to my learned friend's argument. What, what we have in the contract is an agreement to 
uh, preserve continuity of service with the bank. But that does not go so far as to uh, provide a uh, term and condition uh, that's more favourable to the claimant than that which is required by the law. The point is whether part nine can apply uh, to the parties before uh, they became an employee and an employer. That's a point of uh, pure construction of the statute and application of the statute. And as to the gratuity uh, point, again at page B28, It is simply a question of construction of that provision at 66.1 on its face and the application of that to the facts. And on its face, the uh, entitlement to gratuity only arises where there's continuous employment of at least one year or more with their employer so defined under the DIC employment law, which is I've previously submitted, is the defendant branch uh, is deemed the employer under the statute. And the claimant had less than uh, one year's service, uh, one year's employment with the with the branch uh, on the termination of his employment. So therefore, as a matter of statute, there's no entitlement to gratuity. The contractual preservation of continuity is neither here nor there in my submission. It just doesn't bear on the statutory entitlement to gratuity. Um, so that deals with all of the issues by way of reply. This is not uh, an issue about jurisdiction. It's an issue about applicable law and when the law applies. And we've given you our submissions. It is plain. Uh, the law had no application prior to the 11th of January 2021. And therefore, the, the, there are the consequences that flow from that um, that are the subject of the application. So unless I can assist you any further, those are the defendant's submissions in reply. OK, thank you very much. Um, you have both given me uh, a very great deal uh, to think about. Uh, I'm not going to deliver an immediate uh, extempore uh, judgment on this, <clears throat> not least because I think some of the submissions developed a little further than the skeletons. Um, uh, that I'd read, or perhaps I hadn't read enough into the skeletons. Um, uh, but what I would like your further submissions on are costs. Um, I don't think uh, that, uh, uh, of course, they're going to be contingent <laughs> upon my findings. <laughs> but I, I, um, uh, I'm not sure, Mr. Kemp, that your side has served a cost schedule. I haven't. So they have. We've received it. So. Oh I, well, in that case, I've 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 missed it. Um, but yeah, they did. Um, uh, Your Honour, um, before twenty four hours before the start of the hearing. Can, can somebody just simply? Uh, well, first of all, does either side object to the other's cost schedule in in terms of amount and so on? So, uh, Your Honour, yes, we do. Um, the... uh, well, in that case, could somebody just quickly ping me um, the um, uh, the defendant's cost schedules on on uh, my email? I'll ask my junior to send those to you immediately. Uh, which email address? Um, the court email, please. E register for both. Can I just get a moment to? Um, I need to get my mobile phone, uh, which has my instruction system on WhatsApp, to make sure that that's being done. Just give me. One yeah, minute. no, I'm very happy. Should we just let's? Should we just rise for five minutes? Yeah, um, that would be useful just to go through the cost as well. Maybe five or ten minutes if we could have a recess. Ten minutes. Okay. Look, um, I make it uh, UK time, um, uh, ten past, uh, just after ten past eleven. So let's resume at. Um, let's resume at 11.30 UK time, so um, uh, that will be 2.30. Uh, 3.30. Uh, 3.30, yes, sorry, looking at my clock. 3.30 um, okay. Dubai time. Okay. Thank you. Proceed. Uh, Your Honour, yes. Thank you. I have uh, both parties' cost schedules. Thank you. 
Um, first of all, um, let's see if the uh, if the defendant succeeds in its application, uh, Ms. Malik, what what order for cost do you say is appropriate? Um, Your Honour, that each party bear its own. And why is that? Because this is, we say, um, a matter which uh, has come before the court. It's an, a matter which uh, the, well, looking at the actual costs, um, the other sides are, we say, highly disproportionate compared well, to... Well, that's another, the, the, leave that's that to one side. Right. I'm just looking at, um, the first question is, is, is what the order should be, not the amount. So that each party bears its own cost because that would be, we say, the most equitable outcome in this matter. Okay, and presumably, Mr. Kemp, you would want your costs. Absolutely. If we succeed, then we are entitled to our costs. Okay, and if um, the defendants do not succeed, Ms. Malik, what do you say? We should get all of our costs. Okay. Why is that? Why is that different? Right, from... we say should never have been bought. Okay. And the application should never have been bought, and when we get into the actual cost, we see it should never have been bought because there's a KC who's involved, and if it was such a straightforward application, we wouldn't need a KC involved. Okay, well, we'll come to that in a moment. Um, uh, and Mr. Kemp, um, if um, if I don't accede to your application, what order should I make? I think we'd have to pay um, the claimant's costs or an occasion by the application. I'm sorry, say again. Well, I think if we lose the application, then yes. we be ordered to pay um, the claimant's costs of and arising from the app our application. So basically, you accept you you accept under both sets of circumstances costs follow the event. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can we just then um, uh, look at each party's um, schedule of costs, Mr. Kemp? Do you have any comments on uh, Ms. Malik's statement of costs? Yes, um, two um, headline points. Um, there's a there's duplication because um, Miss Malik has also instructed um, co-counsel Miss um, Mayo um, from Gately, and we don't have any breakdown for any of those costs uh, that are claimed as disbursements. And what we do know is that Miss Moyo produced a single witness statement, um, her first witness statement which essentially largely sets out the um, test to be applied on a, an immediate judgment strike out application. But other than that, her um, involvement in the um, matter is wholly unexplained by the cost schedule. And it seems likely, given that Ms Malik is um, <clears throat> seeking to recover some 40 hours of time spent on documents in total, there would be duplication between the two. Um, and so, <clears throat> Um, those are the two points. Um, duplication um, that hasn't been explained with Ms Moyo, um, 40 hours on documents excessive. This is a case where the claim the defendant has brought the application, has done most of, most of the work in terms of putting the bundle together and so on and so forth. And so you'd expect their costs in principle to be higher. <clears throat> um, but we would seek a, um, a, a reasonable reduction on that sum taking into account those points, I'd suggest something in the realm of 30 to 40 percent off this, the amount claimed would be fair. OK. Thank you. And Ms Malik, what do you say? Thank you. I'm grateful. Uh, firstly, to deal with the point of Ms Mayo, just so we're aware, uh, Your Honour, Ms Mayo's a co-counsel. She's put that in her statement. We do operate the relationship, if you like, of solicitor barrister, aside from the fact that my law firm is part one and part two in these proceedings. So she has done work that she's entitled to do. She's not on record with the DFC courts because she's not conducting the litigation. Uh, my law firm can. Um, so in terms of, of, of the, the uh, uh, work she's done and with duplication, absolutely not. In fact, what I'm going to invite the court to see is if there's duplication or if there's excessive work, it's simply on the side of, of the defendant. And by way of example, um, the 45 hours work that's done on documents. Well, we're, not, we're not talking about the other side's schedule yet. Okay. Well, with Ms. Moyo, um, her, her, the work that she's undertaken, and it's written as a disbursement, the same way uh, my learned friend's 
uh, 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 work is written as a disbursement simply because Clyde's have instructed him, even though the reverse situation applies where in fact I'm instructed by the solicitor only because of the way the DFC operates and we're part one and part two, are we on record, but there's no duplication. She's provided a statement. She's worked with the client as well as the first part of call, not me. Um, and I have worked as counsel and as, if you like, um, a, a, a person with conduct to the litigation. And when the 45 hours, which is referred to in terms of my work done on documents, what my learned friend fails to see is uh, his solicitors have 25 hours at higher rates, much higher. His um, senior associate is at the, who, who uh, is junior, four and a half years, is at a higher rate than either myself or, or Miss, Miss Moyo. But in any event, 25 hours on documents there and then all his work, because they instructed externally and they instructed a KC, which we find in disbursement. So my 45 hours at a lower rate is probably much less than their 25 hours at a much higher rate and then getting leading and junior counsel involved to no doubt work on documents too. So that argument falls down. OK, thank you. I'm great. And uh, what do you say now? Sorry, moving on to the uh, defendant statement. I mean, obviously, you've made the point about uh, that. Is there anything else you want to say about the quantum of their statement? Uh, it, it's excessive, Your Honour, and I, I'm concerned about the fact, and I think it's telling. We say um, that these are, are not proportionate and reasonably incurred, but we also say that they, the, the application ought never to have been bought. And I say the most telling facts in their statement is with the, the greatest of respect, if it was such a straightforward application, why do you need a KC looking at it? They've got KC cost of 2,100 to make sure they've got it right, the application. If it's so straightforward and you want the court to grapple with it and you want an immediate judgment and you want a strike out because it's either an abusive process or it's such an obvious point that this should not follow through, why do we need a silk on this? Okay, anything else you'd like to say? Thank you, Sano. No, uh, and Mr. Kemp, anything that you would like to say on your statement? Well, we, we say that um, it's obvious that the um, defendant's costs are going to be higher um, overall than the claimants because the defendants are the ones that have bought the application and have had to do extra work on it, for example, the bundles and so on and so forth. Um, but we, we would say that the amounts are reasonably incurred. The KC disbursement is simply £2,100. It's a uh, not many hours of, of super, supervisory work is reasonably incurred, um, given that this case raises points of pure law. And um, we, we've also asked in our draft order, um, if you're with us and um, you, you, you grant us an order for our costs in principle, that the claim would be ordered to make a sum of 50% uh, of a payment on account uh, of costs. Um, uh, if if I make orders for costs, this is a short application. I will um, undertake an immediate assessment, uh, uh, and uh, I, I will. It's only necessary to make a payment on account of fifty percent uh, if it's uh, going to a, a detailed assessment, which it won't. Very well. Well, um, that that um, concludes um, my submissions on our own cost schedule. Um, Thank you very much. Just one further point, if I may, I do apologise, Your Honour. Um, no, 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 please. It then. Um, it's been suggested that uh, naturally the uh, applicant, the person or the entity who brings the claim is going to have more work to do. It's their claim and they have, they have the burden of proof, let's say. But if you look at the documentation, if you look at the authorities referred to, if you look at the skeleton arguments, ours is about 10 pages longer. The more work has been done, we'd say, on our side, but at a much lesser cost because we've just been more reasonable, both in our hourly rates and in the actual time expended. That may be a difference between big law and boutique law. I don't know, but uh, the, there you have it, Your Honour. OK, thank you very much. Is there anything else that either of you two would like to raise? Your Honour, no, not from the defendant. And not from our side either. Well, thank you both very much. As I, as I said before, uh, I, I have to reserve judgment. Um, I don't find this an easy case. Um, um, I, I'm travelling back to Dubai actually this weekend, back on Monday. Um, I hope to be able to um, uh, provide a written uh, judgment next week. Um, uh, and uh, as I said, it will include uh, 
uh, an immediate assessment of, of costs if I consider that to be appropriate. So thank you both very, very much for a, an interesting morning or afternoon, uh, Ms. Malik, thank you. Uh, and uh, you'll hear from me next week. Very thank you very much. Yeah. Good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.